Welcome everybody to St. Peter's Baptist Church, our online service, whether you are at home uh, or here in person, it's great to see you, whether you uh, are wearing normal clothes or whether you're sat at home in your pajamas, uh, you are very warmly welcome to this time of worship this morning. These are strange times, aren't they? Uh, and uh, one, one of the unchanging things is the nature and character of our God of hope. We worship a God of hope. It says in the Psalms, you turned my wailing into dancing. You removed my sackcloth and clothed me with joy that my heart may sing to you and not be silent. O Lord my God, I will give you thanks forever. And so uh, Nat and Rob are going to lead us in our worship together this morning. Let's praise God together. you that even when times are weird, when life is strange and our feet may fail in unknown kind of uh, 
waters and whatever, that you are still with us, that you care and that you love us and that you are our friend. For today's Bite Sides, we are going to think a little bit about friends, but just before we do that, um, I want to tell you something that we've got going on at church this week. So um, in the run-up to Halloween, which is next Saturday, uh, the St. Peter's um, community, the Friends of St. Peter's, have organised a pumpkin trail all around St. Peter's, and there's lots of different houses taking part, um, and children can pick up uh, a map or download one from online and kind of go on a bit of a pumpkin hunt around St. Peter's, which is really fun. Um, so we're actually taking part in that as well. So this afternoon, I'm going to be transforming uh, one of the coffee shop windows into a little bit of a um, Halloween display with a difference. Um, so we're going to have pumpkins and lots of autumnal things um, and some Jesus Light of the World posters um, and some information about Halloween um, and the fact that our God is bigger and Jesus is the light of the world and we've got some little books as well that children can pop into the coffee shop this week and take away with them. Um, so if you're around this week and you just want to have a look at uh, the coffee shop window then yeah I'm going to set that up this afternoon um, and please feel free to have a look but it's great that we can be part of the community still even in these really unusual times. So, bite-sized, friends. We're going to think a little bit about friends. So, um, 
I'm sure that everybody has a friend. Everybody has got a friend. Now, I want you to think for a minute about one of your friends and about something nice that you like doing with one of your friends. Uh, if you're at home, then maybe you could even write in the chat box um, on the computer what you like to do with your friends. So I've got a friend, uh, and we both really love Galaxy Chocolate. So when we get together, we like to eat Galaxy and watch a film, because um, <laughs> that's a really fun thing for us to do. But actually, one of my best friends, Becca, who I'm just talking about, she lives pretty far away. She lives about three hours away, so we don't get to see each other that much. And especially at the moment, with all the coronavirus restrictions, it's even less. But actually, maybe you've got friends who live quite close by that you're not even getting to see that often at the moment because of everything going on. Especially, maybe your friends from church. Actually, we haven't had normal church in quite a long time now, have we? So, that you might not have seen your friends from church in ages you know, when I was in primary school, I had lots of nice friends. They were really, really lovely, but none of them were Christians. None of them went to church or believed in God. And so my friends from church were really, really important because they encouraged me to keep on believing in God. And it was together that we would learn new things about God. And you guys might not have seen your friends from church for a while, so I want to encourage you today that maybe, maybe you're the only Christian in your class at school. Actually, I want to encourage you to keep on going, to keep on believing in God and keeping on in the faith because Jesus and God, they will never leave you. They'll never let you down and they will be the best friend that you've ever had. So that's why I want to leave you with today, thinking about God as our best friend. Now, as I said, it is Halloween this week, so in Virtual Sunday School, we're going to be looking a little bit about that and a little bit at the fact that Jesus is the light of the world and that our God is bigger than anything that we might see that's scary this week. So don't forget to check that out on the uh, church website. Uh, but before you do that, let's worship God with our kids' praise song today. When you 
knock, 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 knock. God opens up the door. Thank you, Nat, for our bite size um, and that. I enjoyed that song. It was great, that. Just uh, one notice that I want to give today, uh, and um, it is really a response to the, 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 the national uh, feeling about feeding children during half term. Uh, it's become a massive issue in our nation, uh, and... Um, without wanting to get into the politics of the whole thing, uh, I just want to say this, that there are opportunities here in Worcester for families not to be hungry during half term. Uh, and uh, a guy called Sam, who actually lives opposite me, runs Mar Baker's shop in Worcester, has taken a lead on this. He's supported by various organisations. You can see that on the visual there. Uh, and um, you can give. Uh, I think we'll probably put this link online so that uh, if you want to give to that you can i believe they're also doing breakfasts or thinking about doing breakfasts as well as lunches so if you want to get involved in that uh, and you want to support that then that is the way that you can do that here in worcester um, as you appreciate many people around the nation and many similar types of projects have uh, sprung up around the nation um, in response to marcus uh, rashford's project um, that he's been involved in. Not bad, really, for a Manchester United footballer. <laughs> so we come uh, to a time of prayer, and we just uh, settle our hearts into prayer now on this Sabbath day. Pray, Lord, that you will show us what it means to care for the seeds of eternity in our soul. Help us to stop counting the minutes, to relinquish control to you. Inspire us to live and breathe with greater ease as an eternal being loved by you. And so in your homes and with me here, I'd like us to start this time of prayer by praying the Lord's Prayer together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. Part of the Lord's Prayer says, give us this day our daily bread. And so we pray for all those who don't have sufficient to eat. We um, continue to hold before God the ongoing ministry of Worcester Food Bank and the many other food banks in the UK. And we also thank you, Lord, for the kindness of all those re reaching out to feed vulnerable families this week during half term. And we pray that all those lunches and breakfasts prepared and distributed will be an incredible help to all those who receive them. 
And we thank you for the kindness of hundreds of similar projects across the nation. We continue to hold before God all those badly impacted by COVID. For the sick, the poor, the anxious, the grieving, the fearful. We take a moment to pray God's rich blessings on those who we personally know affected in such ways by this pandemic. And we continue to hold before God all our persecuted sisters and brothers across the world. You may be aware this week, following Wednesday's parliamentary debate, looking at the recent report written by the Bishop of Truro, we pray, Lord, that our government will implement the findings of that report. We pray for a special envoy to be appointed who can be an advocate for our persecuted sisters and brothers across the world. And as an Open Doors partner church here, we pray for them and others who do similar work, the advocacy work that they do. Lord, in these challenging and wearying times, we come to you. For we ask all these prayers in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord and our Saviour. Amen. Amen. If you've got your Bibles with you, we're going to... Um, Open the word of God in 2 Timothy chapter 4. This week um, is our last on this series, Resilient Faith. And, and I think we've um, been able to dig into this powerful letter that Paul wrote about resilient faith. So let me read from verses 9 to 22. Paul is writing to Timothy. Do your best to come to me quickly, for Demas, because he loved this world, has deserted me and has gone to Thessalonica. Crescens has gone to Galatia and Titus to Dalmatia. Only Luke is with me. Get Mark and bring him with you, because he is helpful to me in my ministry. I sent Tychicus to Ephesus, when you come, bring the cloak that I left with Carpus at Troas and my scrolls, especially the parchments. Alexander, the metal worker, did me great, a great deal of harm. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. You too should be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. At my first defense, no one came to my support, but everyone deserted me. May it not be held against them. But the Lord stood at my side and gave me strength so that through me the message might be fully proclaimed and all the Gentiles might hear it. And I was delivered from the lion's mouth. The Lord will rescue me from every evil attack and will bring me safely to his heavenly kingdom. To him be glory for ever and ever. Amen. Greet Priscilla and Aquila and the household of Onesiphorus. Erastus stayed in Corinth and I left Trophimus sick in Miletus. Do your best to get here before winter. Eubulus greets you and so do Pudens, Lin Linus, Claudia and all the brothers. 
the Lord be with your spirit. Grace be with you. This is the word of God. So today is our last look together at 2 Timothy. Um, A little bit of context. Uh, Paul is at the end of his life. It is the end of the end in his life. He's in Rome. He's uh, writing from a dark and dismal prison cell. The Roman Emperor Nero has been descending into madness, made worse by the great fire of Rome in AD 64. And Paul, the waiting sentence, is an easy, easy target. The Christians, not protected by the law, uh, were scapegoats and terribly persecuted during Nero's reign. The whole of 2 Timothy, it being Paul's last letter, It sort of reads, if you take the whole, it reads like a a sort of state of union address. Or in Paul's case, a sort of state of the church address. Uh, And we've discovered a number of things in this letter. Paul is wanting to encourage Timothy. That's a a, a feature of Paul's uh, writing. If you read Paul, and let me encourage you to read Paul. He's a good read. One of the great things that comes across time and again are those notes of personal encouragement to whoever the the letter's being written. He encourages Timothy to be bold, not timid. To endure hardship. To preach the gospel. To keep the churches under his care within the bounds of sound doctrine. All the things that I said last week. He's sort of passing, what's going on here is he's he's sort of passing on the apostolic baton in the same way that our Christian forebears have to us. We follow in that long tradition, don't we, in our generation of those who've gone before us, who've passed the baton on. And so Paul is passing the baton on to Timothy. He's making final arrangements. He's putting his house in order. A big feature of this final passage is that Paul talks, as you've just heard, about a range of people. A couple who badly, two of them badly wronged him and the many who were faithful allies. Um, We'll come to them in a minute. All 17 of them get a mention uh, in, in, in a minute. We'll come to that. But the starting point here is Paul's longing for Timothy to visit him. It's a personal and human point here. Do your best to come to me quickly, it says in verse 9. And then in verse 21, he adds a bit more. Do your best to get here before winter. No, of course, this is the world of of no instant communication. So when Paul wrote this, he knew full well that it would probably take the best part of three months before Timothy got to read what he was saying to him because he was in another place Uh, we know that um, Paul passed this letter on to Tychicus who took it to Timothy in a different place probably took him the best part uh, of three months to get to Ephesus from Rome and then of course Timothy would have had to respond quickly and then get back to Rome so it probably been a six month turning circle at least from the delivery of the letter Verse 12, and uh, we know that Tychicus would have covered for Timothy whilst he was visiting Paul in Rome to look after the church at Ephesus. Well, we've no idea whether Timothy made it or not, actually. It's a little bit sad, isn't it? Um, We don't know. But what strikes me is that Paul, this is the point, that Paul wants his beloved son in God to be at his side and to go and be with him at his last that's what he wants more than anything it's such a human story he longs for Timothy's company partly at least because it says here in verse 10 he's been deserted by Demas it's, a, it's another reminder that faithful friends are much needed in times of trial it's true that isn't it I mean, faithful friends are are really important in our life. 
but never are they more important than when we are in times of trial. Which brings me on to um, our 17 individuals. I, I wonder why Paul goes into such detail. I think the answer to that is because when Timothy takes on his mantle, he wants Timothy to know who he can trust. I think it's probably that simple. So, um, I, I think we're going to see on the screen here, Paul, I wonder if we could do this. We could go to the first of my tables. Uh, and we've got a list of friends there, or foes. I don't know whether you can see that. I hope you can. I'll explain it anyway. So uh, in the first column, we have a name of the individual. Then we have a column to tell us whether they were a friend or a foe. Then the places where they fitted into Paul's world. Um, and a good number of them are mentioned in the book of Acts. And then a final column, if we know any other details about them. Um, so let me just go through some of these characters, because I think it's worth doing. It certainly touched me and challenged me this week when I was preparing this. So Demas, verse 10, I've already mentioned Demas, of whom Paul said he loved the world too much. And he deserted him and left him for Thessalonica. Colossians 4.14 mentions Demas as an associate of Paul, as a supporter of Paul, as a fellow partner in the gospel. But he's obviously lost his way at some point. I guess we shouldn't judge Demas too harshly for walking away, certainly given the level of persecution back then. Maybe he was just weak. Uh, maybe he'd all, it all just got a bit too much for him. Maybe hanging out with Paul back then was too costly. And it was costly. But he went, he left. It happens. But it doesn't lessen its effect on Paul and the tone of sadness and solitariness in Paul's message here. It is one thing, isn't it, to be on your own, but to be alone when you're facing your final journey. Well, thankfully, they weren't all like Demas. We come to this character called Crescens. I think that's how we say it. Crescens, Crescens. He was a good guy, very possibly one of the very first missionaries. Um, after the time of Paul, we know that he ventured into what was then called Roman Gaul. That's Western Europe. Who knows how far west he got. Then we have Titus. We've heard of Titus before, writer of the epistle of uh, Titus, another good, good uh, guy, convert of Paul, as many in this list are. Um, he went to Dalmatia what is now Croatia. Anybody ever been to Croatia on the holidays? A few of you. Um, well, uh, former Yugoslavia, evidently a beautiful country, never been. Uh, that's where uh, Titus went. Um, then we have Dr. Luke, uh, very much part of the inner circle. Where I put IC, that means that they were definitely part of the inner circle of Paul. Uh, so we have Dr. Luke, writer of Luke and Acts, a great supporter and friend, a bit of a shadowy figure Luke. We don't hear loads about him. Uh, he was a Gentile by birth, and therefore he had uh, something powerfully in common with Paul. Probably came from Antioch or Philippi. He was well educated. We know that he was a great writer with first hand accounts of the life of Jesus. He wrote Luke Acts, probably written actually during this time when he's in Rome with Paul which puts it about 35 to 40 years after the events um, in the gospel that he writes about. And of course, he had his medical gifts, which were extremely useful. At the last, as verse 11 says, it says he was the only one left with Paul. Dr. Luke, one of the New Testament's unsung heroes. Let's hear it for Luke wrote more words than any other person in the New Testament. Not more books, but more words. Well, then we have Mark, uh, John Mark, probably the same Mark who wrote the Gospel and who was a close associate of Peter because Mark's Gospel is really a Gospel through Peter's eyes. Um, we, we know that he was uh, the cause of a fairly heated argument between Paul and Barnabas in Acts 15. 
because he deserted Paul in Pamphylia. So Paul and Barnabas went their separate ways because of John Mark. Mark went to uh, Cyprus with Barnabas. Well, here he's urging, Paul is urging Timothy to bring John Mark with him. Verse 11, get Mark and bring him with you because he's helpful for my ministry. I like that. There's obviously a reconciliation that's taken place there at some point. It's a happy ending. Paul and John are along the way. Then we have Tychicus, another good guy, trusted inner circle, who delivered Colossians and Ephesians and was tasked with um, being the deliverer of the, the, the book of Second Timothy, very close associate of um, Paul's. Then we have Carpus, a good friend, gift of hospitality at Troas, where Paul left his scrolls and parchments in his safekeeping. So he must have really trusted him if he left um, some of his written work with him. And then we have this character called Alexander the metal worker in verse 14 who did great harm to Paul. If you want to know the story, it's in Acts 19, 33 to 34. He was instrumental in inciting a riot and uh, great opposition against Paul. He's mentioned as well in uh, 1 Timothy 1 verse 20. He was a thorn in Paul's side, not a deserter, but a wolf in sheep's clothing. He caused havoc in the church and grief to Paul. It's interesting, isn't it, how Paul processes this. Verse 14, the Lord will repay him for what he has done. Because Paul knows it's not his job to seek revenge. The Lord will repay him for what he has done. But he says to Timothy, you be on your guard against him because he strongly opposed our message. That's Alexander the metal worker, an enemy of the gospel, an enemy of the message, and an enemy of Paul. So if we were at a pantomime now, we could do a boo and a hiss for Alexander the metal worker. And quickly to the other nine, um, all good people, Priscilla and Aquila, verse 19, hospitable, kind, um, led church. Probably um, um, Priscilla was the first women female leader, very possibly in the New Testament. In Corinth, we have um, Anisiphorus, I can't say that, he lived in Rome. 2 Timothy 1.16 says of him, he often refreshed me, Paul writes, and was not ashamed of my chains. I love that. He wasn't ashamed of Paul's chains. We have Erastus in Corinth. He gets a mention. Trophimus, who was sick and stayed in Miletus. Um, and then the rest are all part of the Rome crowd. Eubulus, Pudens, Linus and Claudia. All converts of Paul and all commended for their faithfulness. So, summary. 15 of the 17, 17 did well, did really well. They're heroes and heroines. I mean, they did that well. Their names are in the Bible. Brilliant. We should applaud them for their faithfulness and for their great courage under persecution. We should. So, perhaps we can go back to, yeah, my earlier slide few final thoughts verse 17 Paul it says Paul will preach the gospel so long as God gives him the strength to do so so he's still he is still whenever he's got strength preaching the gospel in prison amazing it reminds me of uh, that that great line in um, that Charles Wesley hymn that uh, we used to sing in the church where I grew up, give me the faith which can remove and sink the mountain to a plain. Well, there's a line in it, which is this, my every sacred moment spend in publishing the sinner's friend. Have you, you heard that before? That's Charles Wesley. Well, that's the same sentiment here with Paul. If he's got any breath in him, he's going to preach the gospel. He's going to preach the gospel, whether it's to the masses or whether to his prison guard. 
That's Paul. He believed, you see, in the gospel, the power of the gospel to change lives and would proclaim it whenever God gave him the breath to do so. And then in verse 22, we have um, the final words ever written by Paul and they simply say two personal things to Timothy. Uh, he finishes, after all his writing, all his work, all his missionary journeys, his church planting and his evangelism with two simple words to Timothy. First is, the Lord be with your spirit. The Lord be with your spirit. Because Paul knew if the Holy Spirit resided in Timothy's spirit, anything is possible. Anything is possible. True words. And the other is grace be with you. Grace be with you. G-R-A-C-E. God's riches at Christ's expense. Grace. It is such a scandalous doctrine. Such an outrageous idea. On which the whole Christian faith is built. Certainly the basis of Paul's thinking and theology the unmerited favour of God. Prevenient grace, grace that goes before, saving grace that saves us and sustaining grace that keeps us. It is by grace that we are saved, writes Paul. It is by grace that we are kept. His grace is sufficient. For when I am weak, then he is strong. This is all Paul. The grace of God. Amazing grace. How sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I can imagine Paul singing that in heaven. And so we come to Paul's final goodbye. He's been through the truth of it, a bit of a kangaroo court in Rome, verse 16, when he offered his first defense. They couldn't throw him into the lions. And you know why they couldn't throw him to the lions? Because he was a Roman citizen, as verse 17 tells us. That's why. But he knows his time is up, as we discovered last week. He has fought the good fight. He has kept the faith. He has finished the race. His work is done. His ministry complete. No more letters to write or jobs to do or churches to plant. No more email inbox to deal with our people to see, our meetings to chair. His work is done. No work left unfinished. It's time for Paul to go home. And he died shortly after. Almost certainly beheaded. A martyr for his faith under Emperor Nero's clamping down on Christians. Probably about AD 67 he would have been in his early 60s when he died, relatively young by today's standards, but not back then. Born in Tarsus in AD 5, died in Rome in AD 67. A fascinating life. Half of it in opposition to God, half of it completely sold out on God's side. Not perfect. We're not talking here about Jesus. Not sin free. But a life, certainly after his conversion, devoted fully to Jesus Christ and his church and the gospel to the Gentiles. When you see him in heaven, perhaps you might give him a big hug. I mean, there's a list, isn't there, people? We might do that too. That's when we can hug people. So we're done. There's 2 Timothy, resilient faith. Uh, and uh, I, I thought it would be good, rather than sing a song together, well, we can't sing in here anyway, whether we might um, engage with a song that we're going to see on the screen in just a minute, which uh, over the years has moved me. Um, it's about coming to God as we are, something which the Apostle Paul knew all too well. So let's um, watch this together now. God of 
of the moon and stars, God of the kneeling fonts, God of these fragile hearts, we all are come to you. God of our history, God of the future. What will you make of me? I come to you, God of the meek and mild, God of the reckless and the wild, God of the un, God of the unreconciled. God of our secrets unconfessed, God of our every living breath, I come to you. God of the rich and poor, God of the princess and the whore, God of the ever open door. I come to you, God of the unborn child, God of the pure and undefiled, God of the pimp and pedophile, I come to you, God of the And the least I come to you, God of the refugee, God of the prisoner and the free, God of my doubts and certainty. God of the wounds we bear, God of the deepest dreams we share, God of our unspoken prayer, I come to you, God of a world that's lost, God of a God who has come to us, we come to you. Well, we sort of got the idea, didn't we? We come to you, Lord. Father, thank you for your goodness to us. Thank you that you're the Lord of all creation. And we take a moment in our hearts to come to you again. Of the world that's lost. Of the lonely cross. We come to you. Thank you, Lord. 
So we've come to the uh, end of our service. Uh, you're welcome to join us afterwards uh, for Zoom coffee. The link will be uh, on the screen. Uh, we're going to say our closing prayer. If we could just put that on the screen, that would be fab. I need to turn around because it's on the screen. Let's say these words together. Loving God, as you send us out into this broken and fragile world, help us to trust the Father to receive the Spirit, and to tell the story of Jesus. Amen. Amen. Thank you so much for joining us this morning. It's great to see you. Hope you have a good week, and God bless you.